Well, good, uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining uh, this first session of, of Tax and Development Days. I'm Andrew Auerbach, head of the BEPS coordination team here in the Center for Tax uh, Policy. Uh, for this session on perspectives of developing countries on the implementation of the two pillar solution. Uh, we're very fortunate. We have a very, uh, we have a lot of registrants for the, uh, for the session, over 1300. I think we're only at about 500 now on screen, but I, I expect that to grow a lot as we go on here. And that represents almost 150 uh, countries and jurisdictions, which is really, uh, really remarkable and a testament to the importance of this issue. Uh, we do want to hear from developing countries uh, and have put together a panel uh, of representatives from uh, from the inclusive framework, um, which uh, I think will will, will be very uh, interesting uh, for you. Um, I'll I'll just introduce them uh, right now. Uh, maybe if they could uh, they could turn their screens on, their cameras on, uh, and then give a little bit of an overview before we we jump into the. Uh, into the questions, into the discussion. So we have Mr. Bevan Sinclair from uh, Jamaica, uh, the Jamaican Tax Administration. He is the Senior uh, Chief Technical Officer and Dispute Resolution Advisor, has over 30 years of experience working on BEPS issues, and, and Jamaica has been very much involved uh, in the discussions in the inclusive framework. Uh, we have Ms., uh, Ms. Vanessa Asibo Mamou from Papua New Guinea. Uh, she's uh, head of the legal services in the tax administration, works on transparency and, and BEPS issues, and uh, very interested to hear the, the perspective from Papua um, as, uh, as, as they work on, on implementing uh, BEPS and, and transparency issues. We have Jeun uh, Ismailov from Azerbaijan State Tax Service. Uh, he is the deputy head of international taxation. And, uh, and Azerbaijan is a new member of, of the Inclusive Framework, joined in December of 2022, and, uh, and so very interested to hear on their uh, journey. We have as well Alpha Gom from Senegal. He's a senior technical officer, uh, technical advisor to the general director of taxation uh, in Senegal, and is a very, very uh, active member, both of the Inclusive Framework, he's a member of the steering group of the Inclusive Framework, also vice chair of our task force on the digital economy, as well as active in ATAF and WATAF uh, technical committees. And finally, uh, Ms. Catherine uh, Lamel from Khedaf. Uh, Khedaf serves, uh, over, uh, serves 30 uh, Francophone countries on uh, tax administration issues, mainly in Africa, but, uh, but elsewhere as well. And uh, Catherine has, uh, has extensive work in, in tax administration, of course, leading uh, that organization. The two pillar solution is, is the solution to address the tax challenges arising from the digitalization of the economy. And it's an extension of the work that we've done on the base erosion and profit shifting and uh, combating tax avoidance by uh, multinational enterprises, which began in, in 2013, and proposes fundamental changes to international tax rules, um, both to address the difficulties that, uh, that the rules have in applying to modern business uh, solutions and, and business models, uh, and also to address the tax competition that's arisen, um, that has driven tax rates low for multinational enterprises and often deprived developing countries of uh, much needed tax revenue. Uh, the Inclusive Framework has been working on this uh, for, for quite a while. In 2021, uh, members agreed the, the basic framework of the solution. And last July, we issued an outcome statement uh, identifying the progress there and the remaining work to be done. One of the things I'd like to emphasize about the two pillar solution is that it, it's really, it's involved discussions, negotiations, um, drafting by all the members of the Inclusive Framework. And developing countries form a very, very large part of that. Almost half of uh, inclusive framework members are developing countries. And many of the aspects of the two pillar solution are there specifically to address their concerns. And they have a lot to gain from it, um, but they need to implement effectively if that's the case. Very briefly, what is the two pillar solution? Pillar one has two components and addresses first the problem that very large, very profitable multinational enterprises often pay no tax in many of the market jurisdictions where they operate, the place where their users and their customers are located. And so amount A of pillar one would reallocate taxing rights. What does that mean? It means take 
the right to tax from one jurisdiction and put it in the market jurisdiction. And, and uh, uh, our estimates have uh, more than $200 billion of profits to be reallocated under Amount A. Amount B is uh, designed to address the difficulty of setting accurate prices uh, between related companies in, 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 uh, that are operating in multinationals. And uh, that's, an, that's an exercise that is very, very difficult. It's resource intense. It, it requires uh, extensive expertise and can often lead to lengthy disputes. And the idea of amount B is to take a certain category of transactions uh, that are capable of a more simple and formulaic approach to setting the correct price under the existing rules. And in those cases where amount B would apply, uh, countries would be able to refer simply to a matrix and say, this company, this type of company making this type of transaction with this type of product um, would be subject to this price. And, and thereby avoiding disputes and providing certainty and freeing up resources. Pillar two is about tax competition. Global rules, the global minimum tax would ensure that all large multinational enterprises, by large, I mean those with at least 750 million uh, of annual revenue, pay an effective tax rate of at least 15% no matter how they organize their tax affairs. And there are two key points to, to, to retain about the GLOBE rules. Number one, because of the way they operate, because of their interlocking nature, we estimate that more than 90% of all large MNEs will be subject to these rules by 2025. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that the way they're designed, the source country always has the right to tax that 15% first. Um, the subject to tax rule uh, is a method to protect developing countries that uh, may have ceded their taxing rights under tax treaties, um, where those payments, that profit is being shifted to a treaty partner, where it's not subject to tax or sub subject to tax at a low rate under 9%. And the subject to tax rule would allow the developing country to tax that back. Slide. Uh, so where are we? Amount A, we have uh, the multilateral convention has been published in uh, early October. It's almost complete. Uh, I would say that 98% of the multilateral convention to implement Amount A has been agreed by all members of the inclusive framework. There are certain narrow issues that remain to be decided. And once they're uh, finalized, we can move to the adoption of a text of the treaty, uh, and a signing ceremony uh, to, to put Amount A in place. Amount B of Pillar 1, the simplification of transfer pricing rules, um, has, been, uh, has been agreed uh, and incorporated into the OECD transfer pricing guidelines and can apply for tax years beginning after 31 December 2024. So next year, uh, those rules can begin to apply. You know, I'm sure that the GLOBE rules, the global minimum tax, they have been implemented uh, in uh, approximately 35 jurisdictions, effective already, uh, many more looking to implement for 2025. And uh, we are working on uh, ensuring the administrative framework for, for the implementation of those rules uh, and to ensure that, um, that they're applied consistently and coherently across multiple jurisdictions. Finally, the subject to tax rule. Agreed, um, it's been published. Uh, we have a, a multilateral instrument that has been approved for signature, is open for signature. Uh, and as well, we're assisting developing countries to identify those jurisdictions that they have treaties with um, that, uh, that they would want to request uh, to have the STTR put in their treaties. Uh, so we expect to have a signing ceremony uh, in, the, uh, in 2020. Uh, I think with that, I'm going to turn to the panel. Uh, so first, I'm going to ask the panel to, to weigh in on, on a really very general, uh, very general questions about the two-pillar solution. Uh, first, what do you see as the big challenges in implementing is legislative, political, administrative? What kinds of, uh, of issues do you see? Um, if you're responding to those challenges already, 
uh, perhaps share a little bit with what your process has been, how you're doing that. And, and, and finally, what are the greatest opportunities in, in looking at the two pillar solution? Where do you see um, the, the, best, uh, the best opportunities for your country? And, and, and where should other countries perhaps focus their energy? So turning to the panel, maybe starting uh, with Bevan uh, Sinclair from Jamaica. Thank you very much, Andrew. And I want to thank the OECD and the tax and development team for um, giving Jamaica this platform to just, um, you know, indicate our, our um, policies and our concerns in relation to the rules. So um, just a brief overview of Jamaica. We are a member of the Inclusive Framework since 2016. And um, we are considered as a small economy um, with um, GDP of approximately 17.1 billion. Um, as far as it relates to the, the rules in terms of the global rules, we are currently reviewing our policy options for the implementation of global rules in a consistent and coordinated matter. We are receiving assistance from OECD and the World Bank in the design and implementation of those rules. Um, based on our preliminary analysis, Jamaica has approximately 180 MNEs within scope, um, having turnover in excess of 750 million euros. Um, the analysis so far um, shows um, risk within the special economic zone. Uh, we think that um, those entities within the, the SEZ will be most impacted given their effective rates of less than 15%. Um, the SES regime starts with a headline rate of 12.5%, and this may be reduced by tax credits. We have the employment tax credit and the promotional tax credit, um, which would bring the headline rate to as low as 7.5%. And um, if you're solely in the business of um, developing um, economic zones, then your rate of tax can be as low as zero. So we believe that um, the global minimum tax will be um, impacting um, this industry significantly. And so we are evaluating the options um, that we have available to at least um, maintain Jamaica's taxing rights in relation to this industry. We also are introducing another um, incentive regime, which is the Large Scale and Pioneer Industries Act, which we think those entities within that um, incentive regime would also be impacted um, by the global minimum tax based on one, the, the large investments that we expect to um, attract. Um, the minimum investment in relation to the large-scale industries, US 1 billion, and the incentives um, will be up to 15 years um, and up to a maximum of 0.25% of Jamaica's gross domestic product. So we are going to see um, the GMT rules impacting that industry as well. As far as it relates to the substance-based exclusion, um, we think that, um, you know, there may be some relief um, as far as that is concerned, but it's not significant to, to, to wipe out um, the, our, change effective tax rate to over 50, 15%. So we still have concerns there. Okay, um, okay oh, Bevan, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on to the, to the panel. And, and uh, I, know, I know there's a lot of thoughts there. And of course, the, the understanding the impact is, uh, is, a, is a tricky business. And, uh, and it, it really does, uh, it requires a, a really uh, whole of government uh, approach to things. But we'll come back to you uh, again in the, in the next round of questions. Uh, if I could move on to Jayoon and 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 to see the perspective from, uh, you know, particularly a new member of the uh, of the inclusive framework and uh, and your view of the two pillar solution, uh, and and what it means there. Again, I'm going to be very uh, uh, strict on the on the three minutes, Jayoon. So uh, so go ahead. 
Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, as you mentioned, then Azerbaijan has been new member of BEPS inclusive framework since then December 2022. And since joining BEPS, Azerbaijan has already incorporated many action plans related to BEPS into the, its domestic legislation. After joining BEPS project, uh, we have started to become more familiar with issues related to pillar solutions. And uh, first of all, we have started economic analysis uh, have been conducted to assess the impact of global rules on country economy. We have almost done uh, all, economic assess all economic assessment. Uh, and uh, we, we believe that uh, most significant challenges in country to, during the implementation of global rules uh, as, are as follows. Like, uh, first of all, uh, the biggest challenges we think that uh, data and information it is very important. We think that implementing pillar one requires access to uh, comprehensive data and information about multinational uh, corporation activities. And, and now uh, we have access some international database, but in any case about the verification we have concerns, and also impact on investment. Uh, Investment agreements like the product share agreement between government and foreign investors generally provide tax benefits. Uh, and this limitation could raise concern for Azerbaijan as its implementation of global rules could amount to breach of investment ob obligation. Also, this is uh, this kind of the, uh, unclear for us. And the legal and regulatory framework, uh, uh, the, the third uh, challenges we, we faced during that, we think that it, it creates some challenges for us. Um, adapting domestic legal and regulatory frameworks to align with international tax standards can be complex and uh, it requires uh, resources from us uh, to adapt a new legislation, new concept into to our domestic legislation. And last, uh, capacity and resource, uh, capacity building. Uh, it is, it is uh, as being identified as low capacity, it is, it is recommended to provide specific training or interactive sessions uh, which may cover the technical seminars, advisor meeting, or bilateral interactive meetings. Because uh, this is this we are using the we have access to all all uh, materials OCD, uh, KSP, and I library, and also we have a subscription and other international taxation articles, but. Uh, in terms of the uh, in, in terms of the capacity building, we need to improve because uh, uh, it, it, in any case it requires a, uh, resources to involve uh, different types of the BEPS actions because uh, uh, we, we we are not only dealing with the uh, two pillar solutions, also we are dealing with the BEPS minimum standards and we have to meet the, these uh, requirements also. Um, Th thank you, Jayun. I, I mean, I think okay. I heard there, you know, the, the challenges of data and info and, and, and you know, uh, private contracts, investment contracts uh, related to uh, related to Pillar 2, but also the capacity building. We'll come back to that uh, in the next uh, next round of questions. Um, it, it's it's certainly a challenge that the whole uh, community needs to needs to work on. So thank you. I'm going to turn mm -hmm. to Vanessa Asibo Mamou from Papua New Guinea. Hello, uh, Vanessa. Okay, um, just for our the Papua New Guinea experience so far with the two pillar solution, um, our biggest challenges um, in implementing the two pillar solution is at the political level at the um, at this moment. Um, similar to our previous experience with other international tax uh, agendas, we envisage that it will take us longer to convince our politicians about the benefits of the two-pillar solution for our country and why we should adopt it. The other challenge for us is at the administrative level. Um, the two-pillar solution will be, at the end of the day, administered by the tax administration. So as such, we need to ensure that the relevant officials within the tax administration are cognizant, well-versed with the mechanics of the two-pillar solution. So far from our experience here in Papua New Guinea, only a handful of officials within the tax administration have been privy to the discussions regarding the um, two pillar solution. So we think that it's important that um, to include all the other relevant um, tax officials that will in one way or the other be implementing the two pillar solution um, once we do take relevant steps towards um, implementing it in Papua New Guinea. Um, 
In with regards to responding to these challenges, we are um, getting our policy colleagues at the Department of Treasury involved in the discussions regarding the two pillar solution. Um, it is imperative that they at the policy um, side of things understand the mechanics of the two pillar solution to be able to help us at the tax administration to convince the politicians about this agenda and its benefits for PNG. Um, we also try to involve as many of the relevant tax administration officials in the discussions regarding the two pillar solution um, that we have had so far with our partners such as the OECD and, and others. Um, the, for Papua New Guinea, the greatest opportunity for us at the moment is the um, ongoing collaboration that we have with the OECD who is at the helm of this um, I'm driving the two pillar solution. Um, we think the, um, um, the positive relationship that we have with the OECD, as well as our other development partners that um, are helping us in the region to prepare for the two-pillar solution, that's uh, uh, a plus for Papua New Guinea at the moment. Um, and it is key for us because we can tap into the technical expertise available via uh, partners such as the OECD and the other regional organizations to assist us on our two pillar solution journey. Um, from the Papua New Guinea perspective, we think in the short term, countries should focus their attention um, on obtaining the relevant political support. Um, that's especially for those uh, countries or jurisdictions that um, are at the beginning stages like us in terms of considering the two pillar solution. Um, I think in the short term, it's important that um, we all should um, get the technical assistance from the likes of the OECD and the others to um, get political buy-in in our country for which regards to the two pillar solution. And for the medium term, we see that um, uh, we can get technical assistance from the likes of the OECD and the others to get the legislative and administrative aspects ready for the implementation of the two-pillar solution. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, really very interesting on the political challenges and, and in the administration, of course, finance officials agree a bunch of things and then it's it's always for the tax administration to, to sort out the details and, and, and implement in practice. Um, do we have we have Alpha Alpha Gom on uh, on? So please, I'm going to turn to Alpha. And again, you have a lot of experience, as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, working in the uh, in the steering group and the task force, and uh, so have been very very involved in the negotiations. Alpha, please, a few minutes from you on on your perspective uh, from your experience in the inclusive framework, but also from Senegal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrew. I'm going to be speaking in French because that's my native language. If we talk about the different questions that you asked uh, for the tubular solution, but also my um, involvement in the inclusive framework, if we start off with the different challenges put forward by the two pillar solution. One is you need to have an understanding of national profits or revenue that is coming in from national groups and that will fall into the scope of the two pillar solution. In order to determine whether these different activities fall within the scope of the two pillar solution, it is important to have access to additional information, but you will need to identify upstream the different actors that are going to fall within this scope, but also their activities. Within this perspective, it's also important to note that a lot of citizens, or a lot of tax authorities rather, do not have sufficient information in order to take these decisions with regards to national entities falling within the scope. Therefore, the first challenge would be data collection. We have worked in close collaboration with the OECD uh, within Senegal to try and overcome this channel. The second challenge is if we've got uh, complementary taxes that can be um, applied to revenue that fall within the scope. Therefore, if we have a group that is having low taxed income, these activities sometimes fall out of the net. We have seen this 
in different uh, in different uh, domains. There is another element as well that needs to be taken into consideration. We need to look at local revenue and local profit that is taxed locally. When we are looking at local profit that has been generated by a group that falls within the scope, the state needs to determine whether this profit can be uh, taxed or not. There are two parameters here. The first is the tax base, and then we also have the tax rate, but the tax base is something that can be impacted by other factors. Therefore, we need in-depth work. In terms of solutions now, we have, we want to ensure that there is centralized and acute sharing of information between different countries. And I believe that the OECD is already working in this fashion in order to allow us to benefit from a better information collection and data collection with regards to companies that are operating uh, on a local basis. We also want to work, we have been working with Samia and the other teams in order to try and overcome these different challenges. We also look at the workforce, assets, and also transfer pricing. All of this information is important for us when we try and decide which activities are falling in scope and not. Now, if I move on to the solutions that can be put forward, when we are looking at the amount of revenue and the amount of profit that have been generated by a company that falls within the scope and we have this 15% figure, we would also need to determine which different reform options are available to a government from a short-term basis. And if we think of the approach now from a short-term basis, what we would put forward for tax authorities would be in-depth examinations and assessments, including the introduction of a national approach, which would allow jurisdictions to use the globe rules to collect taxes or additional taxes, and this according to the global rules, which means that when we have this 15% figure that comes into play, the use of tax incentives would not then have an impact on other uh, source country treaties. We also need to consider the fact that this can only be a short term process. In the midterm, we would need a larger reform from a tax purpose in order to identify and try to have a list of the different entities and also identify what the reforms that would necessary would be. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Alpha. Um, really, uh, I, again, hearing a lot about, about the difficulties of, uh, of analyzing the impact and, and understanding uh, both the rules and, 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 and the, the, the universe of taxpayers in a particular jurisdiction. I'm going to turn to Catherine uh, Lamel from, from CREDAF. Um, and, you know, it a, it comes from a different perspective, obviously, as a regional tax organization, uh, working to a great extent with, with countries in, in Africa, but also in other parts of the world. So what you're hearing about the challenges of the two-pillar solution from your membership and, and, and maybe the perspective of CREDAF itself on, on, on what it needs to do to, uh, to support uh, your members in that regard. Catherine. Uh, merci, Andrew. Je vais Thank parler... you very much, Andrew. I am also going to be speaking in French because I am representing an, or an international organization for French-speaking countries. CREDEF has 30 different French-speaking members in 24 African countries. We have a lot of heterogeneity amongst our countries. Why? Because with the 30 countries, I have 70 jurisdictions that are part of the inclusive framework. Obviously, the others don't. For me, the challenge that is put forward um, is multifaceted. CREDAF is there in order to accompany and support its members, especially in mobilizing resources from tax revenue. We also want to help them in their reforms. 
and given the differences between the different countries, the principal uh, issue is of a political fashion. Why? Because we want to try and explain, and this using other countries. Alpha has just actually spoken about Senegal, who is part of CREDEP. We have countries that are one step ahead of the game when it comes to understanding reforms, and we have others who are maybe struggling a little bit. Therefore, the interest of an in of an organization such as CREDEF is to put forward uh, because our countries, regardless of whether they're part of the inclusive framework or not, they participate in all of our actions. Therefore, it's important for us to ensure that everyone is singing from the same song sheet and they understand the implementation, the implications rather of implementing these rules. And this can then have access, help them have access to different works that we're doing especially to show the budgetary interest, the budgetary impact of the rules, which is very, very important for countries, especially developing countries. And then the other challenge here, we had a more political challenge. This is a human-based challenge. Why? Because for countries that are, in develop that, that are developing, we want to implement uh, legislation, but also um, ensure that these rules are, um, which are very complex, are implemented efficiently. We don't have that many people who are able to implement these rules, which is where the subject of today has come from. And I believe that we're going to be talking about this in the second part of the session. Supporting and accompanying our different countries is very important. And this is important for implementing these different rules. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kathleen. Indeed, uh, I mean, one thing you mentioned is that you you uh, serve a number of non-inclusive uh, framework members, and um, for uh, for all of these rules, really, uh, whether or not you're a member of the inclusive framework, uh, you know, they can still apply, and you can still benefit from them, or they will still have impact. And so, it's really important to be able to reach uh, non-members of the inclusive framework, and and our work with Kaida and other regional tax organizations is very important in that regard. Um, I'm, I'm going to, I think we're a little short on time. I, I just uh, very briefly for me about, uh, about uh, the capacity building question. Uh, the OECD, of course, and the Inclusive Framework has agreed that, uh, that uh, we need more resources and we need to coordinate with, with regional tax organizations and other IOs um, in, in developing a plan. Uh, we provide, as, as Manal uh, in her remarks mentioned at the beginning of the session, uh, a, a training across many issues. Uh, we have extensive um, tr uh, training material, uh, online resources, uh, in-person and, and, uh, and video seminars uh, at the disposal of tax administrations around the world. Uh, we heard from Vanessa and, and, and Alpha the importance of, of bringing uh, the tax administration people in and making sure people understand what the rules are about. And they may not have been involved uh, in, in the discussions in the inclusive framework. And so uh, really, really uh, key. But uh, it, it covers a number of issues. As, as, as many of you have mentioned already, it's, there's administrative challenges, political challenges, there's legislative uh, challenges. And so for capacity building side, and I turn back to Bevan now, uh, who can maybe very briefly, I think we have about two minutes uh, for each of you. Um, Bevan, if you'd like to, to, to give us your view on, um, I, I, I guess, what's the, you know, what's the number one priority on capacity building uh, and, and, and what's your experience maybe with the interaction of, of different, um, you know, different organizations or different uh, capacity building providers? Um, maybe same question to, 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 to the panelists generally, but Bevan, two minutes from you, please. Thank you, Andrew. Um, based on our experience so far, you know, we have been working primarily with the World Bank and the OECD in terms of capacity building. Um, the main areas is in terms of the details of the various um, pillars and, you know, what are the implications for Jamaica. Um, I think um, the collaboration so far has been very productive um, and the involvement in terms of the stakeholders are the policy makers um, and it's also tax administration. Our objective um, at this point in time is to ensure that we understand the impact 
of the rules in respect of Jamaica, and also whether or not um, you know the the options are feasible in terms of implementation. We have a very small legislative um, uh, persons, and, and as such, we need the type of capacity building in terms of uh, legislative drafting as well. You know, we welcome the option to use, for example, the reference model in terms of the design of our um, road rules, and that is one of the options that we are looking at. But so far, I think the collaboration with the um, different um, international organizations is going pretty well for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, I think I'm I'm hearing a lot about uh, about the globe rules, about the global minimum tax, and of course, uh, both in the previous interventions and and here from Bevan, that that's the kind of the number one priority for countries. I guess just to remind, there's four pieces of the of the two pillar solution, and uh, certainly that the transfer pricing uh, work will will come onto line, and, and as well as the subject to tax rule. Um, Turning back to Jeun, uh, I mean, I think we maybe we already heard a little bit from you on the capacity building side, in terms of your 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 needs there. But maybe if you could identify uh, briefly what what your number one kind of priority is, and 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 how working with with multiple organizations can 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 be efficient, or uh, how it can be most streamlined. Yeah, thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, I I I would like to mention that uh, we had a. a... Good cooperation with the uh, World Bank and uh, Asian Development uh, Bank in order to train our uh, staff in in terms of international taxation issues, including the transfer pricing and uh, two pillar solutions, and uh, also uh, uh, other additional uh, issues related to BEPS measures. Uh, and also, uh, state tax service itself uh, funded uh, some international. Uh, uh, how to say international uh, examination related to inter uh, related to international taxation issues like the uh, audit uh, IBFT. Uh, our staff has already passed uh, the some of these uh, issues, and uh, we try to to involve uh, to to uh, increase our staff on on the international awareness on international taxation issue in in this matters also OECD I would like to mention the OECD uh, especially last year so we have been involved in capacity building on transfer pricing issues uh, uh, which has already trained by OECD experts, uh, Thomas, and uh, our staff has uh, involved into, in, into these programs. And la uh, additionally, uh, it will be better to, to, uh, to get the addition on two pillar solutions activity related. Of course, there is a, we have a access to KSP and we are using the efficiently these uh, platforms for our uh, awareness but uh, in any case uh, maybe we can we need uh, additional uh, resources from OECD also thank you very much thank you thank you yeah and uh, Jayun mentioned uh, KSP that's the uh, knowledge sharing platform hosted by the Canada Revenue Agency and uh, provides access to tax officials with uh, training material and uh, uh, and courses um, Thank you for that. Vanessa, I think you already mentioned the importance of, of supporting your, your tax uh, administration officials in, in understanding the rules. I guess, what, what, you know, what are the number one means uh, that, that, that would help do that for you? And, and uh, um, are you working with other organizations that, um, that, that, that are providing support in this area? Thanks, Andrew. Um, yes, for us, the um, biggest challenge for us at the moment is to understand the mechanics of the two pillar solution and each of the aspects there. Um, I, um, we have been getting technical support from um, partners such as the OECD and as well as the Asian Development Bank and our regional tax um, administration body as well for the Pacific um, in terms of the two pillar solution. And that has been really helpful, I guess, from the PNG experience, um, the in-person discussions regarding um, 
the two pillar solution, which is like we all know, very technical in nature, is most favorable for us because you get to get um, uh, uh, all the relevant people in the one room and to hear from the experts how this thing will work and how we should get ready for. And that for us has worked so far. Um, of course, the virtuals, we've attended a couple of virtuals and had a couple of discussions with our partners over the last couple of years. But I, from a personal perspective, the in-person meetings are much preferred, especially with such technical things. Um, like the others, we continue to utilize um, um, other platforms such as the KSP, as well as um, other trainings that are um, uh, put out by the OECD and our other partners. Um, the ADB as well has been really helpful to Papua New Guinea in terms of um, uh, bring us up to speed with the two pillar solution. Um, with regards to how uh, regional tax organizations and international organizations can collaborate more effectively and efficiently to help us, um, uh, I think uh, from our experience, we feel that um, we can get more effective assistance from regional tax organizations and international organizations if they reach out to individual countries such as us and, and, and inquire as to the specific needs regarding the two pillar solution. Um, I'd also just like to allude back to the positive um, relationship that we here in Papua New Guinea have had with the OECD and I guess that has helped us really um, you know, take steps in addressing, implementing the two pillar solution because we're able to reach out via email or a phone call and, you know, have discussions as and when we need. And um, that's something that has worked for Papua New Guinea in terms of um, progressing the two pillar solution in um, PNG. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Um, really uh, heard a lot about the World Bank and the ADB being very active in this area, and, and we're, we're working closely with both those organizations. Um, Alpha, maybe uh, from your side, uh, what, uh, you know, what is the, the, the number one area of, uh, of support and the, and the means, I guess, uh, you know, what, what, do you, what does Senegal need and, uh, and, and what's available there for you? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrew, for giving me the floor. As Catherine mentioned earlier, the two-pillar solution is very important for our countries, regardless of whether our countries are members of the inclusive framework or not. Therefore, given the complexity of the rules, it is important for us to understand all of the different elements and the impact on policies that these elements will have. Given the lack of experience from a lot of civil servants in developing countries, including my own Senegal uh, and others who have not participated in the design of these rules, we would need technical assistance. What does technical assistance mean? We mean that we want in-depth technical assistance to understand the rules. We want to help, uh, we want help with rolling out a roadmap. We want an evaluation of the impact in our country. We also want help with evaluating, evaluating rather existing tax treaties and all measures and their compatibility with the new rules. We would need advice with regards to the implications and the political impacts. We would also need a strategy for public consultation as well as recommendations for its implementation. We would need support in writing and drawing out legislation as well as implementing said legislation, the best um, adapted version for Senegal. Better synergy with regards to interventions coming from international organizations on the African scene, be we talking about ATAF, the OECD or the World Bank. And we also want to thank Samia and her team who are working tremendously important work with regards to the two pillar solution and its implementation in Africa. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Alpha. Uh, indeed, uh, we, we, we have a lot of engagement. Samia's uh, heads are, are working in, uh, in uh, Francophone Africa on transfer pricing, working very closely with Senegal and many other uh, many other countries. That's a that's a quite a that's a lengthy list, but it it, it reflects um, the the scope of the issues involved. Uh, in particular, I noticed Alpha you'd mentioned uh, a strategy for public consultation. I think that ties in. Uh, very clearly with the need to gain political support and, and stakeholder support that this is something that's, um, you know, it's complex to understand and to, to, to make people understand the benefits of it. I, I will also note that immediately following this, there is a session on the economic impact of the two pillar solution. And so that uh, will also uh, describe our work on, on, on how countries can uh, can measure the impact there. We have just five minutes. I want to hear from Catherine, particularly on uh, on on RTOs and and how you can coordinate uh, or, or or help with the delivery of, of, of technical assistance um, in, in 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 your role as a regional tax organization, Kathleen, you have two minutes. Sorry. So our role, as Credit Credit as I mentioned earlier, is double faceted. To begin with, we have a link with the OECD, and we want to give information on the updates of what's happening with pillars one and two because not all of our countries are on uh, the same level which is why we organize different meetings to talk about legislation what is the interest in being members or in signing up to this different legislation we will have a session actually on this very quickly because next week we have a session with the oecd on these different subjects following this we have sessions that are a lot more technical on questions that are more specific for example we have a session on tax treaties. We will also have other subjects, for example, training trainers for transfer pricing, and other subjects that are actually quite specific when we think about the French speaking countries in Africa. It is very important to understand the context that we're working in. And Alpha reminded me of us of this. We have different possibilities to offer technical assistance that is a bit more honed in on. Uh, the different contexts that our member countries are working in. When we think about CREDEF and the advantage of an organization such as ours, we bring together lots of different organizations that are called NTOs, and this allows us to work with these organizations. We share information, we organize joint webinars so that all of the countries can benefit from all of the actions that we can lead that we're talking, we work with the World Bank, with the OECD, uh, for all of these different trainings that are dedicated to the pillars. In addition to this, we have more global work with other organizations so that our members can benefit, um, and so our tax authorities can benefit from all of this as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kathleen. Um... Really, I think that uh, that encapsulates, uh, you know, the challenges ahead and 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 the, the need to 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 cooperate and coordinate, and and bring together, you know, everybody working in this area. Um, I I think we we are almost out of time. I think uh, we had uh, we had interest from Thailand to to give uh, some of their experience uh, in uh, in working through these issues. They've made a lot of progress, particularly on the global uh, the global tax. Is is Sawalak, uh from Thailand uh, available there? Oh, hi everyone. Um, I will have just a quick share, um, an experience from Thailand, um, in terms of the legislation, impact assessment, capacity building, and also the challenge that we face. So, uh, firstly about the legislation, Thailand is currently in the public consultation process. We have posted the policy bill on the Roman Department website. We also visit the large um Thai multinational firm to inform them that we implement we will implement the group rule and then listen their feedback and secondly we are also working on the impact analysis under the pilot project of the oecd which is very useful is not only analyze the impact of the group rules but also allow us to apply the technique or the concept to 
uh, our domestic tax measure or other tax policy. And lastly, in terms of capacity building, we keep updating news from KSP platforms, same as Azerbaijan and then also Papua New Guinea. And we also receive bilateral assistance from OECD and ADB to better understand some issues. And one of the challenges that we face is the complexity of the group rules, especially regarding the adjustment of the group income and the cover tax. Um, so when we draft um, our law, which is we have to turn it in our language, which is really complex. Therefore, our legal officers are drafting the primary law as the core of the GOP rules and all the details such as the calculation in the secondary law. However, we aim to exercise our right to collect the taxes as a source country at the very least and not lag behind other country. Therefore, we expect the law will be effective by the end of this year. Therefore, the implementation of the GOP rule will start with the accounting period beginning in 2025 for IAR, UTPR, and QDMTT. And I hope that uh, our experience would be helpful for some country that face the same challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really, uh, a really good, uh, I think, endorsement of, of the work we, we've done with Thailand. Really appreciate uh, that opportunity. Uh, you, you, you touched upon a couple of things that I think resonate. Uh, the public consultation, uh, this is a, a, you know, there's a public consultation, there's an internal consultation. Uh, often the ministries of finance, you know, kind of do their own thing. But here we're in an area where uh, it often involves other ministries, other government agencies, parliamentarians. The legislative aspect is is obviously a challenge as well. So thank you very much. And I know uh, Thailand's done uh, a lot of work there to implement uh, and and to collect, as you say, the the taxes that uh, that are due uh, as as a source uh, as a source country. Uh, and I would like to thank very much the uh, the panelists, uh, Catherine. Uh, Alpha, Vanessa, Jayun, and, and and Bevan for sharing their their experiences for for uh, Sawalak from from Thailand also for pitching in on on their experiences. Uh, I think that was really interesting.